Welcome to the workshop. My name is Tyler Mongan. I'm the co-founder of Haku Global, where our mission is to accelerate leadership future intelligence. And today's workshop is on neuroscience-based future intelligence and the six pillars of future intelligence. The agenda today is why future intelligence is not just foresight. We're going to look at why leaders default to short-termism, why a neuroscience-based approach to future thinking is more optimal. We're going to look at the six pillars of neuroscience-based future intelligence and why building future intelligence is essential in complex, uncertain, and exponentially changing emergent tech-driven futures. So Haku Global, the name Haku comes from a Hawaiian word, and the meaning of Haku is to weave together, like we see in the image here, a lei uh, or a rug. And on deeper levels, Haku can mean to orchestrate a song or a story or to navigate the unknown or the future. And so one way we like to help leaders navigate the unknown is through expert knowledge. And we've gathered a global advisory group of experts in the field of business, foresight, uh, futures, military, uh, neuroscience, technology. And we bring them in on trainings or we harness their knowledge and expertise to develop content and curriculum that helps really build the next generation of leaders. Now, as we talk about this idea of foresight and futures and future intelligence, you may have a traditional understanding of foresight. And typically that means to utilize tools and methods to optimize and harness collaborative future thinking. When we talk about future intelligence, we're really talking about developing first the cognitive and emotional capacity to think about and imagine the future. Then the traditional foresight of utilizing the tools, methods to optimize and harness collective intelligence about the future. But then also adding on a even further component of the capability to avoid risks, take advantage of opportunities in the emerging future while actualizing preferred futures. So future intelligence has this full spectrum of starting first with our neurophysiology all the way out to collaborative action. And today we're going to look specifically at the cognitive and emotional capacity to think about the future and imagine the future and how uh, that relates to neuroscience and future intelligence. So future intelligence uh, as an idea um, is in line with the idea of emotional intelligence. It's a natural capability that we have. Uh, it's an evolutionary advantage that we have as humans to be able to think far into the future, to explore alternatives, to not just think about what's going to happen in the next moment, what's going to happen in the next 15, 20 years. And also future intelligence, thinking about the future, is essential for leadership. Uh, you know, If you don't have a future trying to build or create, then why do you need a leader to help you get there? Now, on a scale of one to 10, I might ask you, you know, how future intelligent is your leadership team or organization? Typically, uh, we hear from people that most organizations are around a three, maybe a five. If you're, if you think you're in a seven or six range, you're way ahead of the curve. Um, so most organizations, most leadership teams do not really feel like they have a high level of future intelligence showing that there is an opportunity to develop this here. At the same time, 78% of organizational leaders are not prepared for the future, and 43% of organizations admit they lack the foresight required to avoid risks and take advantage of opportunities emerging in the future. At the same time, we know there is a strong business case for foresight and futures intelligence. Um, research by Rene Robrick showed that future-prepared firms outperform the competition in terms of productivity, profitability, and growth. And in a survey of Fortune 1000 CEOs, thinking like a futurist was the top skill for the next generation of leaders. So the question is, why has future intelligence and foresight been underdeveloped and underutilized, even though we know that it's uh, valuable to an organization, valuable to a leadership team? Well, if you look at the traditional understanding of orientation to time, we tend to think of this idea of past, present, and future. Uh, there's a, a, a survey you can take, uh, mindtime, I think.com is the organization. Uh, you can take a little quiz and they'll put a dot somewhere in this past, present, or future for you. Now, for me, I think mine's a little bit into the future here. I think this might be my dot. And typically, when we think about uh, doing foresight or doing futures, we try to get the people who have their dots in that future box. Uh, maybe not as focused on the present or the past, but more future oriented. We get them together and we have them think about the future. What we're going to find out is that's not necessarily uh, the most optimal way to explore the future. But typically, we think of the future uh, on this linear scale. 
past, then the present, then the future. We might even think about these in a, a feeling sense. For example, the past, there was a lot of certainty. We know what's happened in the past. In the present, we're looking at predictability. What can we actually predict to happen in the next few moments or next few days? But then when it comes to the future, there's a lot of uncertainty that rests in that space. And we think of foresight as this ability to look into that uncertainty, that space of uncertainty, look at what's possible on the horizon, develop scenarios, look at alternative futures. And that's a pretty good assessment of what we, how we typically use foresight. But then when we ask organizations, right, what is the time horizon for, for their leadership team or for their organization? And if I asked you what you think yours is, what we find out is that most time horizons are compressed to shorter than we really need. Um, leadership time horizons are typically around uh, two months, maybe six months max. Uh, typically, we don't see leaders going out even to two years. 79% of the leadership teams felt pressure to demonstrate strong financial performance over a period of two years or less, typically less. 44% said there's a time horizon of less than three years for setting strategy, right? And 73% said they should use time horizons of more than three years because they realize that if they had longer time horizons, they would make better decision-making and they would have more positive effect on corporate performance. So, the challenge is that when everything's going fine, leaders don't feel like they need foresight. Right? And when things are not going fine, leaders do not have time for foresight. So we're in this bit of a conundrum here. And also we have this psychological issue that when it comes to trying to predict the future, trying to look at the short term and what we can predict to make sure that we're making the right decisions as a leader, we try to look to the certainty of the past. And that certainty of the past will then drive the future predictions. It'll drive our future decisions as well. And we fail to look into that uncertainty. So we're leaving a lot of unexplored risks and opportunities that might help drive our predictability in the present and decision-making in the present. Now, in a complex, uncertain, exponentially changing, I call Q world, uh, an emerging tech world, leaders don't know what is relevant sometimes. They don't know what's important for developing that future vision uh, or making decisions or directives. There's an overload of data and information, constant disruption of emerging tech. There's rapid speed of change, overwhelming amount of risks and opportunities. And sometimes leaders make have a hard time, make it difficult for them to see the future, see that future self that they're building, uh, the future of their organization as well. So there's a corporate pressure, psychological pressure, and technological pressure to default to short-termism. So how can leaders overcome this default to short-termism so we can get more future thinking, more future intelligence? Well, we go back to my time at Hawaii, and I remember visiting this island called Koho'olawe. And on the island of Koho'olawe, um, which is now uh, very decimated because of uh, bombing, it was actually a bombing test site for the military, and it's kind of destroyed all the vegetation there. So we went there to do some work to start to rehabilitate the uh, vegetation on the islands. But what's interesting about Koholave is it's typically seen as the navigator's island. That's a place where navigators would go to train. Um, and at the very top of the island, there is a rock formation that looks like a seat. And it is legend that on that seat, the lead navigator would sit and they would point the ships in the right direction. So they would see where the ship was in the ocean if it was aligned, let's say, on a voyage to Tahiti, was it? did it have the most optimal start? Was the direction as perfect as possible? So they had the optimizing of the start. So I think that idea of optimizing the start as we move into the future is very important because the Hawaiians knew that if you didn't optimize the start and you sit on that journey, if you're a little bit off, by the end of the journey, you would be way off, right? So a lot of times, though, the problem is in business, we focus on the results. We have a team. We go through a process, we get results. And whatever results we get in that process are the right results, right? Because that's what we got and we have to deal with and use. But what happens if we take the team and we first optimize the team? We optimize the start of the team and then go through the process and get the results. Would we get better results? You know, what types of results could we get by focusing on optimizing the start? And so the question was we asked at Haka Globals, how can we optimize the start of foresight? and futures thinking. So a little hint here, uh, this image gives us a clue of how we optimize the start. And if you take a second and think about what, 
not necessarily what this image is, but maybe even how it was created. So maybe uh, you've guessed that is some form of lights uh, in motion. So this is a long exposure camera, and it's actually positioned above a person. And the person was my martial arts teacher, and he was doing a martial arts form. And as he went through the form um, and recorded it, he would change his feeling state. So sometimes he would feel sad or depressed or angry, and he wanted to see how that would change the form, even though he was doing the same exact movement with a different feeling. This this image right here, uh, which looks very nice and elegant, was him feeling happy and joy uh, when he did it. And so it really highlights this idea that we are brains, minds, and bodies first, right? And that our neurophysiology is going to have a huge impact on the outcome. So when it comes to optimizing the start, it really starts with optimizing our inner neurophysiology, not even our, just our mindset, but even something beyond that. And so what is the state of the brain when faced the pressure of a complex, uncertain, exponentially changing world? So how could we want to look at you know, what is going on with the brain when it's faced with these challenges? How can we optimize it for this complex, uncertain, exponentially changing, emerging tech environment? And then what kind of futures would we think about when we did that? So we went back and looked at uh, some of the neuroscience of the brain and realizing that the brain is a great context for that starting point. What we found out is that at higher states of consciousness, um, things happen to the brain that are different at lower states of consciousness. When I mean consciousness, I mean the the neuroscience, the, the actual science of consciousness, meaning how we study the awareness states of the brain and what's going on in the brain when it's aware or not aware. And so what we find out is that everyone has this kind of normal uh, functioning range, okay, Uh, which we see here in this middle bar with the orange uh, writing of normal functioning range. And typically, our consciousness moves within that range, okay? Now, we can go to lower states. Typically, we see this when someone is moving into unconsciousness, for example, thinking of being anesthetized during surgery, but also as you fall asleep as well. Then we can also go to higher states of consciousness, right? So we can actually expand ourselves outside of our normal functioning range and elevate our consciousness, be more aware of things. So what's also interesting is that at the low ends and high ends, uh, we see unconscious states can emerge. So when someone goes too low in their state of consciousness, they can become unconscious. And when they move into higher states of consciousness, meaning too much, uh, too much awareness, right? Too much activity in the brain, which we're going to see, they also can become unconscious. So what we do see, though, uh, when people move into higher states of consciousness, we see more power in the brain. We see more connectivity uh, within the brain. We see more novelty of ideas, more novelty of connection as well, more complexity happening, more uncertainty in the brain because it's changing a lot, Um, and again, rapid change happening. And also what we see happening because as a result of this higher state of consciousness, as we push ourselves uh, beyond that normal functioning range, we see novel futures emerging innovations, better strategies, new ways of collaborating. So this idea that higher states of consciousness correlates uh, with complexity, uncertainty, and exponential change, right? We see that higher state of consciousness, the complexity, uncertainty, and exponential change is also happening in the brain. And so that could mean something for the physical world as well. You know, as we move into a world that's more complex, uncertain, and exponentially changing, leaders need to be able to maybe expand their state of consciousness. Maybe they need to get more comfortable uh, in higher states and and use that higher state to be able to navigate that uncertainty, complexity, and exponential change. So we went deeper into the neuroscience, and we looked at the brain and how it uh, navigates a complex, uncertain, exponentially changing world, and we came across this work by a man named Bernard Bars. And Bernard Bars was looking at uh, how can we develop better artificial intelligence. We need to understand how the brain actually works. He developed a model called the global neuronal workspace model of the brain. And the basic idea behind this model is that the brain is like a chalkboard. Of course, it's not a chalkboard, but it's like a chalkboard. And it's faced with complex, uncertain, exponentially changing world. And then relevant content is fed into the brain. And that relevant content competes and collaborates to develop a dominant goal or future frame. Now, that future frame then determines what strategies, innovations, decisions, sense-making is relevant based on that context. So at Hakko Global, we want to look at what is this idea of the the relevant content, right? What content is relevant uh, for the brain, and what are the systems that are being activated to gather the content 
And what we find out is that there are uh, five major systems that are activated as the brain is thinking about the future. The first one is the past or the memory systems that has our mental models and our biases in it. The second is the present or our perception system, which is activating our sensations and feelings, our interoception, exteroception. Then there's the focus or the attention system that's being activated. There's values or evaluation system, which also deals with the continuity of self over time and how we sustain our values as we move from the present into the future. And finally, there is the future, this anticipation system of our muscles and actions uh, that are also uh, pulling in content into this kind of global workspace of the brain. Important to realize that the future is now seen as only one component of foresight. It's not the only component. And as you can see, I have this arrows kind of uh, filtering back on themselves. So as this information is fed, uh, as we, I guess, feed information uh, back into that system, we're also going out into the future and then pulling more information and pulling it back into this neural workspace. And it's part of this content, okay? It's not the only content for futures thinking. So one thing you can ask yourself kind of as an assessment of um, your ability to do foresight is, is one of these areas kind of dominating your thinking? And what we've seen in quite a few people, the past uh, and the present are heavily dominating uh, in their futures thinking. For other people, you might see that it's values that are important, or a futurist might say the future is more important. The idea is that as we're pulling this content into the brain, potentially getting weighted based on what we think is important as well, um, and it's influencing our ability to see what could emerge in the future. And so we see as we uh, look at this, for example, this um, this two loops of change model, you know, as you understand which uh, system is made more dominant for yourself, you'll start to see why you think a certain type of future might emerge or why uh, a certain type of past was important and what parts of that past need to be brought into the future, what parts need to be discarded, and what's that transformational vision and the bridge to that new transformation that we think is relevant. Now, context, though, is also very important. So although we're looking at the brain and the systems of the brain, we also want to understand the context of the brain and how we set context, because context is going to determine what type of information is also sent to the brain and what's relevant in the moment. So think, for example, a sympathetic state, right? If you're in a fight or flight sympathetic state um, and you're about to get eaten by a lion, the type of content that's relevant and relevant for the future is very different than if you're in a more parasympathetic, parasympathetic rest and digest state. So if you're relaxed, you're thinking about the future, you're going to think about a very different future than if you're about to get eaten by a lion. You know, your future might not be so important. Uh, maybe the next few moments and your ability to run away or fight uh, are most important then. So based on our sympathetic state, it determines what information can be uh, accessed by the brain. And some information is deemed ir irrelevant, no matter what system is providing it, simply because of the neurophysiology state we're in. Another thing that's really interesting is that there are these um, networks in the brain. They've identified a couple of them, the default network, salient network, executive network. Uh, these are groups of, of systems that are working together uh, to provide a certain physiological state for a certain type of task. The default network is typically referred to as our self-referencing network. Executive network is our um, action network or on task network. And the salience network helps us to understand which network we should switch between. Should we be in the default or be in the executive network? One of the things we find out that's interesting is that typically foresight is associated with um, the default network. That ability to do self referencing, self reflection, self awareness actually has been shown to increase our ability for foresight, whereas more the executive network activation is, is typically more associated with strategy. So, what's important here is again, this idea that context above the brain is going to shape the content that's accessible for our ability to think about the future. And you want to make sure you're in a futures thinking brain when you're trying to do foresight and in a strategy brain when you're trying to do strategy. Also, when it comes to different foresight processes, what's interesting is we can start to apply this uh, neurophysiology context and understand, you know, when we're in foresight within this process, we need to be in a certain type of brain. We need to be in a certain type of thinking. And then when we move into a strategy, 
We need to be into another type of brain. We need to move into that executive network. And that will really improve and optimize our ability to not only do foresight, but also to link foresight to strategy. So we see this global neuronal workspace as a, a unique cognitive architecture that really helps us to understand how the brain thinks about the future. And from this, Haku Global has developed what we call the six pillars of future intelligence. They're context, past, present, focus, values, and future. And these six pillars are mapped to neurocorrelates. There are certain mindsets, skill sets, tools, and behaviors all associated with these pillars really help to advance future intelligence within a leader, a leadership team, or an organization. And here's a nice, more fancy uh, image of this future intelligence model that we've developed. This Haku Global Cognitive Architecture is a really robust model for understanding not only how the brain works, how it thinks about the future, how it develops future frames that now dominate our ability to develop strategies, scenarios, sense-making, design thinking, innovation, and strategy, and how we can actually use this framework to really create the most optimal future frames to mobilize action among our teams. Now, this sounds a little theoretical maybe for you, but uh, we've tested this out empirically, uh, one, through many episodes of Future Intelligence Leadership Podcast, getting feedback from experts and hearing their ideas and thoughts. We've interviewed experts uh, and leaders around this topic of future intelligence. Uh, we've presented uh, at conferences on the topic to get feedback, and also we've written and published uh, articles. For example, uh, we published a chapter in the book, Leadership for the Future, on this, and again, we have our global advisory team that really helps us to keep this content really practical and relevant for today's leadership teams. We've also developed the Future Intelligent Design Canvas, which is a one page uh, that really helps uh, harness that collective intelligence and de develop a collaborative future frame or goal frame for a team or an organization so they can really harness individual resources and team collaborative action to achieve their goals faster. And we've seen this working with, for example, a team a team at Rolls-Royce where they reported back and said, you know, we've implemented faster than we've ever implemented before uh, using your methodologies. Uh, we've also worked on developing uh, a link between future intelligence and the current foresight tools out there. So for example, you know, why do we look into time horizons? What's going on with the brain and, and why it wants to do that and why it's essential for the brain uh, and related to our ability to perceive the present and how, how developing scenarios and alternatives really help us to understand focus and values of individuals uh, and the team itself, and how looking at emerging ten, trends really helps us to understand what we're anticipating in the future. So we think future intelligence is a unique and neuroscience-based approach to strategic foresight. It really works on optimizing brains, changing minds, connecting hearts to build and scale futures. And some of the outcomes we've seen working with teams is increased access to novel and deep futures, higher coherence with preferred futures, collaborative visions of the future, high levels of strategic alignment. Uh, you know, overall, after doing facilitations and trainings, a feeling of we're going to do this and then implementing faster than they've ever implemented before. So really there is this kind of evolution of foresight. You know, maybe a long time ago, uh, there was the Oracle of Delphi. You would go to the mystics and ask what's the future and they would tell you what the future was. Uh, we've advanced over time through science, uh, through evolution, statistics, uh, systems thinking, and now we're in the space of complexity and emerging futures and quickly moving into this space of quantum AI futures. And we think it's more important than ever for leadership and leadership teams uh, to develop their future intelligence. And so they can always have a pulse on the future and be ready for the future, no matter what future emerges. So if you found any of this interesting, then I'd like to invite you to join the Applied Future Intelligence for Business Training. It's a program we run online. Uh, through Haku Global. It's an eight video program. It allows you to learn this material at your own pace. You'll be prov provided with all kinds of tools and methods that we've used uh, working with leadership teams and organizations to help them develop uh, and scale future intelligence. And keep in mind that what we're going to teach you in this course is things that you can apply immediately. So a lot of times, if you're familiar with foresight, it seems like this long drawn out process. There's things you can start doing right now to develop future intelligence within yourself and your team and apply immediately have impact on your organization.